Hello, my name is the Doctor. Are you watching Headless? Reverse the polarity. Hello, hello. Gorgo is bloody fantastic. Who's this Gorgo then? I hear you ask. Well, don't worry, because I'm about to tell you all about it. Gorgo is a 1961 product of the kaiju craze that spawned after Godzilla kicked off. And, as the title suggests, directed by Jojine Lauré, Gorgo is the UK's first and probably most significant contribution to the genre. I guess you only really have this and Conga, which was actually released the same year. Down the life of a true kaiju gazer. But then you get into the discourse about if something is a kaiju movie, if it's made in the West, since kaiju specifically means Japanese. I'm the only one with a microphone. It's a kaiju movie and Avatar is anime. Get over it. The effects are honestly bloody amazing for a movie released in 1961, and the plot is frankly a welcome breath of fresh air. But before I start shilling out endless praise for this forgotten masterpiece, let's introduce it to a new crowd and take a look at the film itself. The film starts... ...and starts... ...and... And there we go! After an incredibly long opening credits, we see a salvaged ship investigating a wreck. Which clearly must have been transporting thousands of tons of hair dye because that is the only reason you are getting away with the sea in the UK looking that blue. And then the ship gets damaged when an underwater volcano goes off because, as everyone knows, it is legally required that all giant monster movies require a spontaneous volcano. Captain Ryan, our main character, and his best friend, First Officer Slade, go to Nara Island for repairs, but alarm bells start going off when the locals will only talk to them in Gaelic, even though they clearly understand English. Now, to give context of where this is set in the UK, these are obviously meant to be the Orion Islands off the Irish coast, but I guess they had to change the name for copyright reasons? That doesn't sound right, but whatever. On the island, they meet Harbour Master McCartin and his assistant Sheen, Sean, who becomes the two sailors adopted. So, I mean, psychic. As the seamen spend more time on the island, they discover this harbour master has a stash of illegally salvaged Viking artefacts. And as the repairs continue, Captain Ryan's divers check the surrounding seas for the divers that disappeared during the eruption when they find one of them who died of fright. And as far as I can tell, this volcano is actually a bit of a red herring as we learn through the boy that there's a legend of an ancient sea monster called Ogra existing in the area, who takes the blame for their deaths. This development doesn't really have time to settle before that night a big boy emerges from the bay and starts attacking the town. Only by Captain Ryan rallying the entire town to fight against it do they manage to ward the creature off. Not one to let opportunity go to waste, however, Ryan and his crew manage to track and capture the creature. Sean warns them that they've made a mistake, but the crew ignore him. Later, two scientists turn up to meet with Ryan and Slade, hoping to obtain the beast for scientific study, but Ryan's already sold the creature to Dorkin Circus in London. That's not once, but twice already in the film where Ireland has got screwed over by the British. First with the harbour master stealing heritage treasures from their land, but now also literally taking a living symbol of their mythology as well. In fact, I'd like to use a section from an article by G.B. Martin called Gorgo, the Irish feminist sea dragon, to put this part into words better than I could. I saw Gorgo when I was five or six years old. I had already seen a lot of monster flicks by that point, and in most of them, the ethnic people were usually people of colour, all white or Japanese people in black or brown face. This goes all the way back to King Kong, which unfortunately depicts black people as savages who the white people could easily exploit. But Gorgo was the first of these movies I ever saw where it's the white people treating other white people this way. Seeing Englishmen mistreat Irish people and animals in Gorgo was my introduction to subjects like hyphenophobia and the troubles involved with Northern Ireland. As a Northern Briton, I was born after a lot of our troubles with Northern Ireland were settled, or best they could be, but to a 1960s audience, this would have been quite topical of the time. And it's around now that the themes of greed are starting to stick out in this movie. The harbour master hoarding the treasures. The sailors offering to get rid of the monster and out the goodness of their hearts, 
but to get a share. And when they do, are faced with the choice between donating the beast to science or making a profit off of it, and they choose the money. And the circus attendant flat out admits that the law will probably require him to hand over Gorgo sooner or later, and that's the reason everyone has to rush out and see him right now. And this isn't a tale of corporate greed, this isn't that movie. Every character in this film is working to survive, and really, in a situation where obviously taking the money is the best decision for them personally, I can't say I particularly blame the working class in this movie, but if just one person's actions had gone differently, we wouldn't now be about to witness a massacre over London. Which brings us to our next point. It's only around now that you start to get a sense of how small the creature actually is. And it's at the village in the dark, so you couldn't really tell then, but seeing it carted around London on a bus makes you realise this monster's only probably about 10 metres tall, which is actually shorter than some dinosaurs. I love this decision. I think there's not a lot of size diversity in monster movies. They're either kaiju-sized or man-sized. Honestly, I wish the fake leaks for Godzilla vs. Kong that framed Kong as only one third of Godzilla's height were real. And this is all leading to a genuinely really sick plot twist. You see that on the poster? That's not Gorgo. In a genuine oh shit moment, we learn the creature on display is only the juvenile and Mama ain't happy. A lot of what follows next is just action set piece after action set piece after action set piece, but that's not a bad thing because the effects in this movie are genuinely incredible. Hell, if it wasn't for some kind of dodgy blue screen, I could be convinced that this was an 80s movie. But no, two years before Doctor Who would face off against a wheelie bin with a whisk, Ogre was annihilating London. There seems to be a bit of geographical confusion here, as Ogre seems to make her way from the Irish Sea to the River Thames, very quickly. The issue is, if she's approaching from Ireland, she would have had about 120 miles of open land she'd have to venture through before getting anywhere near London, which we know can't be the case because we never see her on land prior and the film makes quite a big deal of her rising out of the River Thames. So the obvious answer would be that she didn't approach from the west but came from the east, which is a reasonable journey ocean animals have been known to make, but it does mean that she went the whole way around the British Channel, which is about 400 miles out of her way, all while fighting the army, all within the span of a day. This is me nitpicking, and I don't think anyone not from the UK would pick up on that, but it did confuse me enough to take me out of the movie. I guess they just kind of forgot which side of the UK island is on. Now, I don't usually divulge the endings of the movies that I'm talking about, purely so there's still a good reason for you to go out and watch it. But I'm going to, because this ending is particularly noteworthy because the monster wins. Ogre finds her hatchling and the two safely leave together. It's not really a happy ending for humanity, but almost beat for beat, every monster movie of the time ends with the creature either being defeated and or killed regardless if it was innocent or not. But in this movie, sentimentality and love win over greed in the end. Add on to that the fact that every single character in this movie has been male, and you could almost say it's a tale of motherly love triumphing over misogyny. And in that same vein, I've made a few sly references to it, but I do actually want to talk about the interesting relationship between Captain Ryan and his first officer Slade. The body language they use around each other is enough to raise an eyebrow on its own, but there's one specific scene where Captain Ryan is like, standing over Sean in bed while Slade sit next to him on the mattress, and it's a template that would usually be saved for a mum and dad. And it's quite consistent with how Slade acts towards his captain throughout the movie, him being a more emotionally vulnerable and nurturing one in response to the captain's more mannish nature. There's even a moment when they're introduced as Captain Ryan and his partner, Sam. And yes, while that terminology doesn't have quite the same connotation as it did now, it's worth noting. And they are sailors, I'm just saying. Basically, while it could be a series of coincidences, I think their relationship, and by extension the movie as a whole, could be read as quite queer-coded. From a pretentious film bro YouTube reviewer standpoint, 
I'd like to say that Gorgo puts a focus on the difference between American and British values, and that's portrayed by the role that we give the monster. While the similarities are there between Gorgo and Godzilla, I actually think it could be more appropriately read as a response to King Kong, which, for all intents and purposes, was an identical setup. Innocent creatures being forced to cause havoc when the only ones that wrong was us, the humans, for disturbing nature. And while Kong does humble us, it does ultimately end with humanity establishing dominance over nature. But in Gorgo, we bow to it. The lesson that this movie proposes is that the arrogance of man is thinking nature is in our control and not the other way round. Aren't you glad I didn't do that in the accent? And in surprising news, Gorgo is actually making a bit of a comeback recently. He and Ogre are having these absolutely gorgeous figurines made for them by Titanic Creations, and as well as a comic book sequel to the movie. Maybe this means that this obscure 1960s beastie can finally start to get some of its dues, and hopefully this video can do a bit towards contributing to that. I recommend checking it out for yourself, it's available to stream off Amazon, or you can just watch the entire thing for free on YouTube. Bare minimum, you can always check it out on Season 9 of Mystery Science Theater 3000. It wasn't the UK's only attempt at a kaiju movie, one such film that was never made was Nessie, which would have been a joint production between horror legends Hammer Studios and the inventor of the kaiju genre, Toho. Two of the most prolific and genre-defining movie studios coming together to make a Loch Ness Monster movie, Hit the notification bell if you want to find out when that video is coming out. Or if you're still in a Gorgo mood, why don't you check out my video on John Carpenter's Lost Godzilla vs. Gorgo fan film. Hope you've enjoyed this strange delve into niche media, and even if you haven't, I hope you have found it just the least bit interesting. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.